What's good, y'all? You are listening to Code Switch. I'm Gene Demby. We've had a lot of very candid conversations over the years on the show with people working through big, chewy questions about who they are, like trying to make sense of just where they fit in in our weird, contradictory racial landscape. Because the way a lot of people see themselves isn't static, in part because the way other people see them isn't static. We've spoken to listeners of color who were adopted as children by white parents, and they were raised in neighborhoods that were all white, you know, except for themselves. And they were having experiences different from the people around them, but they didn't have the vocabulary to talk about it because their white parents didn't talk about race. Or on the flip side, we've also spoken to people who told us that even though they were born and raised in their Black or Latino or Iranian families, that they personally felt like racial imposters because other people were not reading them that way. Maybe they didn't look or sound Black or Latino or Iranian enough. You know, you know I'm doing air quotes around all those things, right? We're going to get into that later. But for the first part of our episode, we're going to hear this fascinating story that I just could not get out of my head as someone who has a twin and who grew up very close to someone and is always calling up my sister to make sure that she remembers things the way I remember them. It's about two people who also grew up together, spent their childhoods looking alike, you know, drinking from the same water. But the math on how they show up in the world ended up being really different. It comes from my colleague, Verilyn Williams. Verilyn is an executive producer here on Code Switch, and she and her sister, they've always been mad close. They're just 14 months apart in age. Um, but for maybe first, just like introduce who you are, just. Hi, I'm Lovis Williams, and I am Verilyn Williams' sister. And they sound a lot alike. Here's Verilyn again. Growing up, everyone also said we looked alike. We both were round, short girls with the complexion I am now. Think Hershey's milk chocolate bar. <laughs> that was true until she turned 13. And Lovis remembers that exact moment. We were in the supermarket and you're like, oh, what's that spot? What are those spots in, on your hands? And I was like, I don't know, because it was just really little and I didn't really think much of it. And I think that after the little spots on my hand is when I started to see like my lips pinkening. And so that's when I first noticed it. It took a while for anyone in the family to take in exactly what was happening to her. I think I remember going with dad to the dermatologist for the first time and just kind of figuring out like, what is this all about? This is what we found out. Uh, assessment that it is vitiligo. Back in 2020, when we were all in the house, Verilyn and Lovis decided to really talk through their feelings about a crucial moment of their lives for the first time. And Verilyn recorded that conversation and originally shared that talk with Kai Wright of WNYC's Notes from America. I'm going to just let Verilyn, Lovis, and Kai take it from here. Vitiligo is an autoimmune disorder. And having any autoimmune issue means your body, for whatever reason, attacks your healthy tissues. In my sister's case, this is her skin pigmentation. And wait, what does that even mean? So, like, her skin is losing its color, or what does that mean? Well, there is a wide spectrum, but essentially, yes, my sister's skin started to lighten. And this is what the doctor told her. Like, oh, it could be that, you know, you get a little bit of spots and it just doesn't progress, or it could progress to the rest of your body. So for me, I was just like, hopefully it's not the lot. <laughs> <laughs> Wow, that that's a lot. I mean, it, to to see your skin start to change that that would be to me that would be scary. Mm -hmm. And we had no clue what would even happen, like what the extent of it could look like, right? So for me, Michael Jackson was my only reference to someone right. whose complexion completely changed, and it never dawned on me, never occurred to me that my sister would go from being Michelle Obama's complexion to that of a uh, Meghan Markle. <sighs> And I mean, there's so much here too. I mean, this is this is complicated stuff. As soon as we start getting into skin tones amongst mm -hmm. Black people, and even those two examples. Yeah, and on top of that, my sister was only 13. 
And I was, I remember being in eighth grade, going back into eighth grade and having it. Because I met my friends before in sixth grade, my friends that you know now, yeah. and Melissa. You know, my, my black girls in action, as we <laughs> called ourselves back then. I forgot that you guys had named yourselves black girls in action. Mm-hmm. Like you had like a, a book or something. Right. We had like a book. We had a mission statement. <laughs> we did event, like we did events. We celebrated each other's birthdays in big ways. We were serious. We were serious. <laughs> you identified as a black girl. Like that mm-hmm. was a big part of your identity. So mm-hmm. when your appearance started to change, like did it impact how you felt? I mean, at that time, like at the end of eighth grade, it wasn't too bad. It was just like for my nose. But then I started using makeup and stuff to help with anything on my face. As long as I wore my makeup, I was still black like I was still considering myself black even into high school like I never it didn't challenge that because I was still mostly black I guess you could say because I had spots like I was transitioning so it was more of a period of transition you know there was no question and no one questioned that when lover says I was still black I know what she means but I'm not gonna lie I flinched every single time she said it want to clarify that I am interpreting what you're saying in the way that I think you are which is like you're saying I was mostly like brown skin yeah my skin color hadn't transitioned out of brown skin and my skin tone was mostly you know and I'm saying black because I you know mostly in a black but still a brown skin woman who identified as a black woman Mm -hmm. so could you still identify it Of course. I mean, I don't, I (laughs) mean, and and even with someone who is as fair as I am, like no one looks at me and thinks that I am at least not a person of color because (laughs) of my features. By the time she graduated from college, all of her brown skin was gone, but she still wore brown makeup. So to the world, her complexion still looked like mine. I've never questioned my identity and who I am while others have. So Mm -hmm. if there's a question of, Am I black? You know, that's just not something I've ever questioned internally. But I do question what other people think I think I am, Mm -hmm, which is very mm -hmm. different. I hear you on the like double, triple, quadruple consciousness that Mm -hmm. happens when you walk into any space. But has maybe a version of your worst case scenario ever happened? Um, I can remember like one time I don't I was at work. My sister works at the Bronx Courthouse. And I, and I'm also like at work, I'm very, I'm a part of like the Black History Month committee in the courts and we do black events every February. And so I'm very, I'm the person who's conscious enough to just be like, oh, we're going to be doing this event. We're having Black Jeopardy (laughs) (laughs) at three o'clock. So come. And so I remember like, I remember being in a meeting with my director and a few other people and we were talking about, it was something that was race related. And I made a comment, uh, like it was an uncomfortable conversation because we have a deputy director who is white and our director who is Dominican. And I think the deputy director said something that was just was not culturally sensitive but I remember saying something like well you know as a black person I do get like no one's going to call me on it because as a black person you know that whole racial comments that we make are not given the scrutiny that that white people and we just we we can say that and and my director was like well you're the fairest woman in here this is my director saying that to me like she made she attributed my skin my fairness to my blackness and I was like what does that have to do with anything anyway but I remember that sticks out to me a lot because I remember her saying it as if it's a challenge to me mm-hmm. and I'm like what does that have to do with my blackness or me being black mm-hmm. you know so mm-hmm. and what about in like black spaces mm-hmm. black spaces is int- I mean I, I don't know if you would call the courthouse a black well there are lots of black mm-hmm. bodies in there and that's where I work mm-hmm. I mean I <laughs> so I guess you could call it that you know and I remember I was like filling in the front desk um I don't know if I had told some woman who would come in, black woman, she came in, she was sitting down and I think I was just like, we only let people who are entering in the program have a seat in here. If you're a family member, whatever, you have to wait outside. Like our policy is that because we don't have enough chairs for everyone. And she, I guess she was upset that I was telling her to sit outside and she was just like, don't let the red bone get to your head. I was like, okay. But like, I guess she was saying, you know, she was a brown skinned woman and I'm telling her that she has to step out. And I don't know if it was the even maybe it was the way I said it to her or maybe she felt like I was 
like talking down to her or I don't know. But then she made that comment um, as if to say that I thought I was better than her or I was acting as if to say, well, you're black. So I don't know why you're acting like that. Or uh, I don't know. But people have, I'm just telling you, people are, people have a lot of ideas about just skin and, and I know that we, you know, there are levels of privilege, right? We know that there's a conversation we can have all day. Um, but there's levels of privilege in America and a lot of it is attributed to how light or dark, you know, I'm very cognizant of that. But I also feel like people, you know, it can happen in the verse where we're constantly just like, well, you know, you're light skinned. So, you know, you're just not as close to the cause or you have like a check, like an outbox. Kai, there have been plenty of moments I had to check someone talking sideways in my hearing because they didn't know the woman they were talking about is my sister. Mm. You know, saying things like, who is this wannabe white woman? Mm. Something to that effect. And I've never brought it up to her because it's always, I don't know, it's always felt too painful. Like, I remember mom driving me, like, deep into Westchester because it was, like, another, like, a treatment, like, a light treatment. And I remember exactly, like, the logistics of what happened. But it ended up being, like, either it wasn't a good candidate because of, like, the amount that it spread or something of that nature. I remember feeling disappointed mm. of not being able to do it because I feel like I had maybe had hopes of it being something that could be helpful for me. And, help, and like, helpful in, like, stuff. just helping with the pigmentation like repigmentation okay um and so i was really i just remember the that feeling of just like ah just kind of like hopeless Mm. this isn't gonna yeah this isn't gonna work and like what did that like once you realized that this was just the way that things Mm. were gonna be um like what did that like how did that change the way that you moved through the world maybe you know what i mean Mm. I mean, it didn't have an impact on, I mean, possibly like an impact on me just socially. Um, I don't know if I really developed many strong relationships after mm. um, junior high, so possibly. When she was in grad school, I remember I told Lovis that she should just stop wearing the brown makeup altogether. And turns out her boyfriend at the time did too. Even though you told me, he told me, it wasn't the reason why I stopped wearing makeup was because his brother told me, you know, you're my family. He's like, he was like family. And when your family tells you something, like, you'd be like, okay, whatever. It's just your family. They love you and they don't care. They all love you no matter what. But then when you hear from someone who's outside, Mm -hmm. it just takes on a different, I guess, a life of its own that's very different. You're like, okay, maybe that's something i should think about mm. um and so actually that's when i stopped that's like over a decade of wearing makeup what yeah. was it like stopping um it was challenging maybe like a couple weeks after not even right away i was wearing like street no makeup and like a couple weeks after stopping is when i went to to macy's and they started doing like they'll you know the makeup uh people they were trying to figure out which one and so right now i wear uh, ivory which is like close to to zero i think it's like maybe one um as opposed to the seven that i was using before you know we attribute a community to color like we we just do and um and i think that that for me was difficult to let go because that is a part of who i am like you know what i'm saying being brown skin you know with all of the bad that comes with that for people developing ideas about black people and mm. less than there's also a community in circle that you're just a part of something that now i'm learning as an older person that skin color is about a cultural experience not so much about skin color but before as a young person you know being black is you know it's just, it's being black. Like, all of the people that we listen to, Brandy, Foxy mm-hmm. Brown, even Little Kim, like, these were all black women. These Whitney Houston, brown-skinned women. Like, this is something that I have yeah. in common with the women that I love to listen to. And so, I feel like for me, it was definitely difficult. And so, I think I did the makeup thing for a very mm-hmm. long time when I feel like I didn't have to because I attributed my skin color was being a part of the community and like Mm. that as a young woman I think that we have a very simplistic view about what it means to be black because you know now I know that that's not true but being young you don't really think about it's you're black you know you're black because you're brown (laughs) like that's why you're black (laughs) (laughs) 
You know, in so many ways, my sister's experience as a black woman who has experienced the world in both brown and ivory skin reinforces what I've felt in my skin, which is loving my black self, that's the easy part. But doing so in a society based on a racial caste system, that, that part, (laughs) that's the struggle. And I think that, you know, that evaluation is very much, I feel like it's a strong, it comes stronger from the black population, the evaluation of who you are as a black person based on skin tone, like at least from my perspective. But I do a lot of black history, I push a lot of things, like we need to do things that are racially relevant just in my places and spaces of work. And I'm very much pushing that. And I don't know, I feel like sometimes that's question. It's just like, well, why do you feel like, like, what are you trying to prove? Because like, am I trying to prove nothing? No. All right, y'all, after the break, we revisit one of our most popular episodes ever. I can't be the only one with racial imposter syndrome. So do you hear from other listeners who feel like fakes? Gotta hope the answer is yes, or I will feel so goofy. Stay with us. You're listening to Code Switch from NPR. Gene, just Gene this week, Code Switch. So Verilyn's conversation with her sister Lovis immediately made me think about one of our most popular episodes. It was an episode about people who felt they had racial imposter syndrome. And for Lovis, the conflict wasn't about her blackness, clearly. You know, that's just not something I've ever questioned internally, but I do question what other people think I am, which is very different. Like my old co-host, Shereen Marisol Miraji, a lot of the conflict she felt came from how other people were reading her. For those of y'all who don't know, Shereen is Puerto Rican and Iranian. She grew up in California and didn't really learn how to speak Spanish as a kid. So she felt super self-conscious when she was in a lot of social spaces. And I, too, suffer from racial imposter syndrome. And it turns out she wasn't the only one. We heard from one listener, Christina Ogilvy. I can't be the only one with racial imposter syndrome. So do you hear from other listeners who feel like fakes? Gotta hope the answer is yes, or I will feel so goofy. So we decided to put out a call for other people who might feel that same way. And uh, we got a lot of feedback. Because I don't look mixed, I never felt as though I quite fit in. In a way, I think I feel guilty for even thinking I'm part black. Like, I don't deserve to identify that way. I barely know any stories about my family members' life in India, Iraq, or Iran. I kind of feel a sadness about the whole thing. I feel like claiming these cultures feels wrong, like I'm an imposter. At the same time, it's my actual family background, and I wish I had more of a connection to it. My parents do not read or speak Japanese. I'm too whitewashed and Americanized to fully understand and relate to the immigrant experience, but never seen as an American. I feel like an imposter. How can I be Mexican if my dad doesn't think of himself that way? This week, we're going to get into this human need to belong and why so many multiracial and multi-ethnic and bicultural people feel like they don't. Mm -hmm. We're loosely calling this feeling racial imposter syndrome. It's when folks feel like they don't fit in with their people, or I guess the people who are presumed to be their people, I guess. Right. It's definitely a thing, Mm -hmm. and we've brought in some special guests to talk about it with us. But first, let's fill out a little bit of Christina's story. You heard her at the top. She reached out to us after listening to Shireen, your piece on Puerto Rican identity. And in her email, she mentioned that you seem to have no issue pronouncing Spanish words with a Spanish accent, Mm -hmm. even though you're only half Puerto Rican. Only. But unlike you, Shireen, Christina feels like a fraud when she pronounces the Spanish words the right way, even though she's also, like you, half Latina. My dad is Afro-Panamanian, but he moved to the States when he was 12. So he he's like the only one of his family who has no accent. He actively mm. tried to lose it. So he's one of those immigrants, right? Um, and then my mom is 100% like so German, she's from Sweden. <laughs> so German, she's from Sweden? Does that mean she's like really, really, really white and blonde? Is that <laughs> That's what, what I'm what imagining. So yeah. I need to like give you some more context here. So she has an Afro-Latino dad. She's a German mom. And in middle school, her dad moves the family back to the States which left Christina this racially ambiguous kid who spoke very formal German, trying to make sense of where she belonged with her friends and peers. So Mm -hmm. when she got to college, she started trying on different identities to see which of those might stick. Oh, I've done that. Have we all? I joined the African American Students Association first, and I didn't feel comfortable there. Why not? Because they were closed meetings. At the time, I was like, well, if my mom can't come, you know, Mm. stop. Um, I I didn't understand the need for 
you know, having a safe space, basically, um, at the time. And I honestly just didn't feel like, I, again, it felt performative. I, it felt performative for you. To yeah. I just, I, I felt fake. I felt really fake. Mm-hmm. Um, but, you know, you're sitting there, you're trying to find yourself. And so, you know, right. it's like, I, I went looking there. Not going to happen. I went looking with the Latinas and I found a bunch of, like, lifelong friends. It was awesome. But, again, it wasn't, it, it wasn't me because I don't speak Spanish. Well, very little Spanish. So everything I know is from, like, music. So let me ask you, I mean, this is a question I'm, I'm curious about. What would feel authentic to you? Uh, one of the most comfortable places that I feel is um, I have a friend, Michelle, um, and she's black. And she is just as nerdy as I am. Like, literally, we're texting about the, um, the, the new Thor trailer. I'm so excited. So I'm so excited. So that is a space that feels really comfortable to me. POC nerds, that is going to be my most comfortable place because I don't have to watch what I say because I do make a lot of lol white people jokes um but then I'm also like you know always talk- just always talking about some nerd stuff you know mm-hmm. and and that is I think where I connect with people now so a lot of what Christina said about how she feels like a fake was echoed by the psychologist I talked to mm-hmm. her name's Sarah Gaither and she runs the identity and diversity lab at Duke University that sounds fun oh yeah I want that job actually. me too me too Her work focuses on why it's so hard for multiracial and biracial people to develop a real sense of self, a real sense of belonging. And her work is very personal to her. Yes, I am a what they call a me searcher. So I myself am biracial. Outwardly, I look very white, but my dad is black. My mom is white. And Mm -hmm. that's made me very interested not only in how race is perceived, but once you learn something about someone from an identity angle, how does that knowledge impact your behaviors toward that person or your expectations you might have? And so my Myself, not ever fitting into the black community, at least physically, has really led me to focus a lot in my own work about this trouble of belonging that a lot of multiracial individuals tend to face in our society. We got hundreds of emails from listeners about something we are calling racial imposter syndrome here on Code Switch. Um, and that's where someone who's mixed doesn't feel like they can truly claim either identity. Uh, where do you see this pop up in your research? I think this falls in line with this basic need to belong um, that really stems from a lot of the stuff that I focus on in the lab. We all want to belong to certain groups. And when a mixed race person is constantly struggling across every context of their life to be white enough or black enough or Asian enough or Latino enough, that creates a sense of imposter syndrome or this extra need to try and belong to these groups. Um, Being constantly told that you never fit in to your respective racial backgrounds really does make you feel like a fake person. It makes you feel like you don't have a family. You don't have a group to call your own. I myself, I carry around a family photo in my wallet every day of my life to sort of prove to people that I have a black father. Really? Um, So there's these, these experiences that we all have within the community that I think causes a sense of imposter syndrome to a certain extent. Um, And what we know from a lot of research to date is that multiracial people tend to face the highest levels of social exclusion compared to any other racial or ethnic group. They're excluded twice as often. Um, And so unfortunately, this constant identity denial, you're not black enough, white enough, Asian enough, whatever the case may be, has led to higher levels of different types of mental health outcomes for Mm. the multiracial demographic because they have this identity crisis, this identity struggle where they're trying to constantly fit into their respective in-groups. What are the rules that are set up? How how are you a part of the group and how are you not a part of the group and who gets to set those rules and who who enforces the rules? Yeah, I wish I knew who set those rules so that I could belong (laughs) to the groups that I want to belong to. Um, The biggest rule that most people tend to use is your physical appearance. I think if you Mm -hmm. can pass as black or pass as Asian or pass as Latino, then you get to claim those experiences of being a racial or ethnic minority group member. So most of my work and most of psychology work overall would argue that we don't like to include ambiguous group members in our group. If there's a reason we can find to exclude them, we will find that that rule or that reason. Why is um, that? It's because we mm-hmm. want to have our groups be who we are, right? We It gets back to this needing to belong, this group-centered focus of identity. We want to be surrounded by people who reflect the same senses of values that we do. Um, and we have this innate ability to want to protect that in-group. Can you kind of walk us through an experiment? Yeah, there's lots of different approaches that we take. Um, So in my work, I find 
if you simply remind a biracial person about their black identity, for example, and then they interact with a black person, that same racial identity mindset is going to make that interaction go really well. People are going to smile. They're going to really just enjoy the interaction overall. But if I took that same biracial person and reminded them about their white identity and had them interact with a black person, you would see more typical negative interracial interaction outcomes that we see in research all the time. So increased anxiety, less eye contact, more fidgeting. Mm -hmm. And so this was some of the first data um, to suggest that if you are multiply belonging to different racial groups, this ability to navigate between these identities really can impact your behavior in different ways, depending on if you're thinking about identity A versus identity B. Do you also prompt them by saying, hey, you're biracial? <laughs> you're, you're yes, both. we also do that. Yeah, we do all kinds of fun. We call it priming in the lab. We do all kinds of those things. Um, yeah, so some of our work, if you just simply ask in a recent paper, that we had published, if you remind multiracial people that they themselves are multiracial, they have these flexible racial identities that actually boost creativity and problem solving abilities for multiracial people. Um, To be fair, that same creativity study, we recruited monoracial people and reminded them about the fact that they have multiple identities because we all have multiple identities. They might not Mm -hmm. be multiple racial identities, but that multiple identity mindset and a monoracial person also boosted those same flexible thinking outcomes. Hearing this gives me a sense of pride. It makes me feel like, oh, yay, you know, something good about us. And then I step back and think, oh, but does that make it seem like I'm better than other people when I really embrace the fact that I have these dual identities? I don't know. I, it's it's this <laughs> I'm having like yeah, a, no, psych- it's, it's a psychological it's, warfare in my head. Yeah, no, it's a struggle. I and mean, that like, gets back to, you know, mixed people on average wanting to fit in with whatever those groups may be and not wanting to have to constantly compare themselves to other groups. What's really unique, I think, about the multiracial experience is the fact that they've always existed in our history. We've always had mixed race people, but it isn't until very recently that the mixed race community overall has been a little prouder in being able to claim those types of identities. Mm -hmm. Um, There's this exotic kind of view of multiracial people as well. And that makes talking about this group a little awkward for some people at some times. Um, So whenever it's brought up as our multiracial this magical super being or this ability to bridge racial divides, I definitely don't think that they're an end-all be-all solution to all of the racial disparities and inequities that we have in our society. But what I do think is that mixed race people as a group really do push our boundaries and what we think about race in a new direction. Our society is really fixed in thinking you can only be one thing at a time. Sarah, thank you so much for being with us on Code Switch and sharing your research with us. Thank you so much for having me. It was really fun. So, Shireen, mm-hmm. can I just say something about this that is just, like, making me itch a little bit? Please, indulge me. So, you know, it feels a little bit like that old stereotype of the tragic mulatto, those characters who are biracial, and they're wrestling with some inner demons about, like, not belonging. I'm not mm-hmm. black, I'm not white. You know what I mean? You feel me? <laughs> I hear you. But then also, and this is sort of a different point from that, like, there are times when, f- when people focus on their mixedness that, in some cases can feel like people are trying to run away from their blackness, you know, out of shame or because they think that might be advantageous to them in some way. Um, I don't know. I don't know. I know what you're saying. And I obviously that happens. We know that happens. Mm -hmm. But I also know plenty of mixed people, plenty of multiracial people who also want to be down with, you know, their brown side. Right, that's right. They would give anything to be all black, et cetera, so they can exhale and finally feel like they belong somewhere. Um, you know, so their friends stop calling them half-breed or off-brand. And let me tell you, this has happened to me. Somebody <laughs> called you off-brand for real? <laughs> yes, off-brand. You know, and it's like, and it happens every time you tell a corny joke or you mm. do something wrong. Like, everything you do wrong is blamed on the fact that you're mixed. And then everything you do right is also assumed to be because you're mixed, getting back to what you were saying, you know? And so I don't know, you just can't win. I guess all that can be true at the same time, you know? All those things can exist in the world at the same time. It's complicated. It's very complicated. We got into arguing about it. Oh, we were arguing about it. You know, there's no right answer to this. And I know, I I feel like you want there to be one answer to this. I don't want there to be one answer. I just. That's why I was yelling at you for like an hour. That argument was like. I just never appreciated the depth of your beige rage. Yes, you know I mean? your monoracial supremacy. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. All right, y'all. That is our show. We always want to hear from you. Our email address is codeswitch at npr.org. Follow us on Instagram at NPR Codeswitch. All one word. You can hear more from Notes from America at notesfromamerica.org. 
We just wanted to give a quick shout out to our Code Switch Plus listeners. We appreciate y'all. And we thank you for being subscribers. So subscribing to Code Switch Plus means you get to listen to all of our episodes without any sponsor breaks. And it also helps support our show. So if you love Code Switch, please consider signing up at plus.npr.org slash Code Switch. This episode you're listening to was produced by Verilyn Williams, Diva Modisham, and Walter Ray Watson. It was edited by Dahlia Mortada and Karen Froman. Engineering was done by Jared Paul, Joe Plord, and Josh Newell. And we would be remiss if we did not shout out the rest of the Code Switch Massive, B.A. Parker, Lori Lizarraga, Christina Kala, Karen Grigsby-Bates, Alyssa Jong-Perry, Jess Kung, Thomas Liu, and Steve Drummond. Our art director is L.A. Johnson. Our intern is Giordano's Tesfazion. As for me, I'm Gene Dumby. Easy, y'all.